Justify Prove to be right or reasonable Justification is at the heart of all legal and political argument But at a time when argument itself is slave to appearances it is time to bring back a culture of justification Justify a podcast on law and politics in India from the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy hosted by Orgo Sen Gupta Welcome to Justify. Our episode today is titled The Illusion of Institutional Autonomy. This is a special episode because I'm joined by a very special guest, the Vidhi lecturer for this year, Justice Gautam Patel, sitting judge of the Bombay High Court. We don't have a deep dive today, but a slightly longer tete-a-tete with Justice Patel. But before that, like every week, here's our roundup. First up on our roundup is a set of orders from various high courts in the country regarding protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act. You remember that the Supreme Court had directed that the High Court Chief Justices be approached since all cases brought before the Supreme Court were fact specific. Now I know there's been quite a bit of criticism about this judgment of the court, but I think the fact that the Supreme Court has intervened in matters like this earlier should be no reason to hold the court to similar intervention in this case. I think it's right that the matters went to the high courts because the high courts perform a critical function in our judicial system and are much closer to the ground and much easier to approach. So I think in sending the matter to the high court, the Supreme Court was vindicated. In terms of what the high courts actually did, there's a real variety. First, let's look at the Karnataka High Court, where the question of the legality of the imposition of Section 144 of the Criminal Procedure Code was challenged. Now, you know that Section 144 prevents assembly of individuals. Now, in this case, the question before the court was whether the Karnataka government could prevent a protest from taking place and whether the imposition of Section 144 for this purpose was valid or not. In a very beautifully reasoned judgment, the Karnataka High Court held that Section 144, before it is imposed, must demonstrate an application of mind. It cannot be done purely mechanically. So it said that it would not get in the way of the protest being organized because the protest traces its genesis to a fundamental right in the constitution and that is a right to free assembly. So it didn't stand in the way of the protest and furthermore prevents any clerical imposition of section 144. I think that's a judgment that we need to commit. Turning now to the Madras High Court. The Madras High Court was approached for directions to prevent the opposition parties from holding a protest regarding the Citizenship Amendment Act. Now, all of you know that the protest did go ahead, and that is because of the fact that the Madras High Court refused to interfere in the process. They also said, like the Karnataka High Court, that the right to protest is a fundamental right in the Constitution, and that it would not get in the way. The police had, however, asked for a responsible person to be nominated who could be held responsible in the event of damage to public property. Since no person came forward, the Madras High Court directed that the entire protest be videographed so that it would deter any damage to public property. A careful balancing act there from the Madras High Court. Turning now to Allahabad. In Allahabad, the High Court was hearing a writ petition filed in light of alleged violence and arbitrary detention of students by state police and paramilitary forces at the Aligarh Muslim University. The court noted that it was alleged that the police lati charged with massive amounts of tear gas, rubber bullets and pellets without any just or valid reason. Several directions were sought from the court, including the setting up of a court-monitored committee. 
The court deemed it appropriate to have a response from the state authorities and gave an early date of the 2nd of January and also directed the district magistrate of Aligarh to ensure all necessary medical assistance for students who have been injured as a result of the Lati charge. So we have to see what happens on the 2nd of January when the court reconvenes on this matter. In Guwahati, the question was relating to the legality of the internet shutdown that had been ordered in the state. Internet shutdowns have become commonplace. They are not narrowly tailored. And I do think a litigation is imminent in the Supreme Court regarding internet shutdowns as a first port of call for governments against protests. But in the Guwahati High Court, the question was on the suspension of internet services in the state. The legal issue was that under Section 5.2 of the Telegraph Act, such interception is permissible and the temporary suspension of telecom services rules allow this. The court had ordered earlier that the state had to place the materials on the basis of which the suspension of the internet was ordered in the first place. It said that the government could suspend the internet but in the present case, when it had renewed the suspension, that was not justified because the court would scrutinize those materials carefully and without justification, it would not uphold the same. So internet services resumed as a result of the court verdict. Finally, we come to the Delhi High Court. The Delhi High Court, you'd all remember, had passed extensive orders in the Tis Hazari incident of police violence. That was a case where there was a violent clash between lawyers and police officers. And the court had ordered transfer of police officers as well as monetary compensation to victims. In this case, the court heard at least six advocates over a long period of time on eight different specific interim reliefs which were sought. This was all in relation to the violence in Jamia Millia Islamia University in Delhi. Interim reliefs that were sought included a fact-finding committee to be headed by a retired judge of the Supreme Court or High Court to be set up, a direction to the police to not act against students, a registration of an FIR against police officers, medical assistance for the injured, preservation of CCTV footage and other evidence, and orders largely similar to the ones in the Tis Hazari matter. The court, however, chose not to grant any interim relief and gave a surprisingly long date of February the 4th when the matter would be heard again. I'm quite surprised that the court said that 4th of February would be the next date. If justice has to be real, it has to be speedy. And the Delhi High Court, as one of the best functioning high courts in the country, would do well to lead by example. There was one other matter, again, relating to the functioning of the judiciary, which found mention on the judicial side of the Supreme Court. That is a Suomoto case, assessment of the criminal justice system in response to sexual offenses. You remember that pursuant to the Hyderabad encounter killing, uh, the Chief Justice of India had made a very welcome statement that instant justice is not the answer and the criminal justice system needed to be looked at holistically. In this case, the Supreme Court took up Suomoto charge of judging ground-level implementation of rape laws in India, especially the 2013 and 18 amendments made post the Nirbhaya incident. It appointed Mr. Siddharth Luthra, a noted criminal lawyer, as a micus curie, and made him responsible for collection of a variety of information from a variety of people. It included information regarding the recording of victim statement by women police officers, compulsory recording of FIRs, provision of free medical treatment, and the frankly antiquated and awful provision of the two-finger test, which despite being outlawed while assessing cases of rape, unfortunately still continues. So I hope Mr. Luthra comes up with what the ground level challenges to implementation of rape laws are and our criminal justice system works faster so that justice is not only not delayed, it is also not denied.
welcome to Tete Tete. My guest today is Justice Gautam Patel, Judge of the Bombay High Court. Thank you very much for joining us. Most welcome. Glad to be here. So we're meeting in the context of the Vidhi Annual Lecture, which you are delivering on institutional autonomy. Tell us a little bit, particularly for those who couldn't make it to Delhi for the lecture, what do you mean by institutional autonomy and what are its uses? Uh, it's a difficult subject, as I <clears throat> said at the beginning. Uh, there are two crucial definitions that we have to understand. One is to define the type of institution that we're talking about. And the second is a definition or at least a working definition of autonomy. And I have argued that while it's all right to leave out certain major institutions like the judiciary or the Reserve Bank of India or the Election Commission, there are other institutions that are being forced into less and less autonomy and that their autonomy is actually crucial to the maintenance of a liberal democracy, one that is founded on constitutional ideals and governed by the rule of law. Uh, let me just explain for a moment what I mean by autonomy. I am not suggesting that it should be free from oversight, but I have used a sort of lexical definition of autonomy to say that this they must be institutions that afford place for a plurality of voices and most importantly, space for dissent. So what kind of institutions do you have in mind? Because you mentioned that it's not the judiciary or the central bank, which are the institutions typically thought of in terms of autonomy. Well, obviously, the first of these is our educational institutions. And uh, one of my uh, arguments is that we have structured education over a period of time, the last 10 or 15 years, to be something which is more skill set acquisition than truly learning. A part of the process of learning in any true educational institution is imparting to students not just skill sets, but the ability to think, to question, to doubt, and therefore to dissent. Uh, there are some institutions that are still islands of this. We need many more of them, and these are the birthplaces of disagreement and dissent. They always have been. Mm. Um, my argument is that it is only illiberal governments that fear the autonomy that such institutions represent. And therefore, educational institutions that are liberal are often the first and the softest targets of illiberal governments. So let's take educational institutions. When I think it really can't be argued against that educational institutions must allow their students to dissent, disagree, question... But the question that arises is autonomy from whom? Because if it's only from government, then I think that's a bit of a platitude. But do you have any other understanding? Yes, of uh, my understanding, in fact, is precisely that, that there is not just a top-down uh, autonomy imposed by a government. And obviously the argument is, as you say, a platitude uh, to say it should be freed from that. More importantly, the lack of autonomy comes from a self-imposed adherence to a political or a particular ideology. And that is may not even be mandated. It often comes from fear of reprisals or fear of something else entirely. The other way of achieving it, of course, is to completely repopulate the management uh, of these institutions by those who owe fidelity uh, to this or that particular ideology or to a political party. Any of these steps actually has the same result. Right. And by autonomy, I, as, I've, uh, as I say, the question is really one of independence. Independence not just in setting a course curriculum or attending to day-to-day -day affairs, but a functional autonomy uh, to be able to s survive and operate free from that minutiae of government control. So how much of that do you think is structural and how much of it is dependent on the men and women who hold that office? That's a difficult one and not easy to answer. It is partly structural, but I think those structures are determined by the people we put in place in those, in those cases. They often dictate the form those structures can take 
And perhaps the simplest example is that though you have the power to do a certain thing, because you personally are in a position of authority in that institution and owe or perceive yourself to be owing fidelity or loyalty, you choose not to do uh, an act in furtherance of that objective. That's right. And I think very few systems can really guard against individuals who don't owe fidelity to the post they hold. That's correct. And I think there's, I think it just it just reminds me of what Ambedkar and Munshi said during the Constituent Assembly debates that the Constitution is there, the checks and balances are all there, and now it depends upon the men and women who work here, Correct. because there's that much that text can do. But let me play devil's advocate for a moment. We, of course, are a Republican government. Uh, the sovereignty resides in we the people, and we have given to ourselves this Constitution. So, given the fact that Parliament and executive government is the repository of the sovereignty that has been vested in the people. Is the idea of autonomy from government, if we focus on that for a minute, how legitimate is that in a republican setup? Uh, that's a very good question, but I honestly think that it sort of answers itself. Republican government is not just a question of being uh, of uh, who is the repository of uh, sovereignty or law. It is essentially about a system of governance that is under the rule of law. And to doubt what the sovereign says, to question it, is essential to the maintenance of that. Let's not forget this, that we are not just a Republican government. We are a democratic republic. Mm. And I think that's the essence of it. You have to balance the two, not just pick one or pick the other. A democracy requires, on its own, might be unworkable. We've taken a meld of the two, and what we have done is that we've actually subjected ourselves to, well, the rule of law, and in our case, that is defined by the Constitution. Therefore, to question any particular government act or any political act is of the essence here, and it is not, I think, valid to say that just because power is reposed in parliament or in a legislature, therefore there is no space for autonomy and that we have no need for autonomy. So I know that you mentioned educational institutions as an example of a type of institution where there must be autonomy, but I can't resist asking you the question in following up from what you said, that bureaucracy today is almost like a fourth wing in our separation of powers trinity as a lot of decisions get taken by by bureaucrats uh, especially in the age of executive government now how do you see the question of autonomy of the bureaucracy uh, we know that we are all familiar with yes minister and yes prime minister and uh, the autonomous well, I, bureaucrats I, I'm, that exist. I am not seeing the bureaucracy as an institution and I have argued elsewhere that it is bad government <clears throat> that has brought us to this place and by this I really mean a bad bureaucracy. There are exceptional bureaucrats in this country and of course one of the ways an illiberal government will function in pursuit of its objective of being increasingly illiberal is to have a, how shall I put this, a faithful bureaucrat mm. who will implement to the letter and with the maximum possible efficiency a policy or an ideology that is thoroughly illiberal in its uh, conceptualization and perhaps even in its implementation. But the independence of the bureaucracy is not something that can be addressed as a question of institutional uh, autonomy. Uh, I'm not even looking at that as part of an institution because, as you say, it's just too amorphous. It's just another thing that has come upon us. And elsewhere, I've argued that we need freedom from this kind of uh, bureaucratic slavery, if you like. We must have more clear-headed bureaucrats who are true to what their mandate is in any particular office. 
That's right. So let's take an example that you gave in your lecture of film certification. Yes. That could be something that potentially in a system bureaucrats could handle and take decisions. How or on what basis do you think they are expected to take decisions that owe fidelity to the job of film certification? It clearly hasn't happened that way in India for a while now. It hasn't happened in India ever. <laughs> That's right. And I think part of the problem, as I've said, is that if the whole process of film certification is subjective and is therefore predicated on a whole mess of other factors, including one's own perception of literature, art, and other subjectivity, subjective uh, issues. I, I'm arguing that the move must be away from, for example, the film certification ordering or even suggesting excisions or cuts to a work. That's not the purpose of the film certification board. It might say that, you know, a film with this content requires an A rating or a UA rating or a U, or it's okay with a, with a U rating. But if you make this cut, then we'll push it into that rating is not, in my view, the work of uh, a film certification board. That interferes with the artistic process, and that is the second level of argument, that all art is political. And the purpose of art, in fact, is to question, to doubt, to look askance. If it is that, and you start taking that away by dictating to the artist what he may or may not do, you're taking away the space and the opportunity for dissent. I think, therefore, it is crucial that these institutions, and I'm not only talking about the film board, but also our art and uh, cultural institutions, must make space for completely autonomous decisions freed from government dictates of what constitutes art. I think this is absolutely uh, essential to a liberal and libertarian state and a thought process something that's fundamental to our constitution. Hmm. But there is a... The... One other thing. On yeah, this. sure. Our <clears throat> cultural and art institutions in India, unlike those in America, are almost entirely government controlled. The yeah. single biggest patron of arts in this country is the government. Now, if you're going to use that to control what the art will actually be, well, you're going to wind up with a bunch of pretty pictures. That's right. And that's really the problem. That's right. And the elephant in the room is this, that it's all government controlled and it has always been government controlled. And of course, we see now some good private museums coming up uh, in India. But, but it, they're very small compared right. to the big ones in the US, which I have a process of self-determination that we do not. Certainly. But if we look at the question of film certification, which is a state function, which can't very easily be privatized unless it's abolished in some shape or form. The elephant in the room is people taking decisions on certification based on political or party political reasons. Everything is political in some sense, as you said, a film is political, no matter perhaps how bad it might be. Uh, but taking it on the basis of party political grounds. And this has happened over the over a course of time. Now, again, I come back to the question as to do you think there is a structural fix for this? Uh, yes, uh, I honestly believe that uh, the Film Certification Board, because it is stated in generalities, the Act uh, is guided by an Act that is stated in generalities, needs a relook. Let's not forget this was a very old 60, 70 year old Act, which has seen only very minor amendments. And the landscape of art has changed dramatically in that period of time. We are in 2020, nowhere near what we were in 1950, uh, in terms of the technology, in terms of filmmaking, in terms of what can and can't be done, how much of it is can be uh, manufactured outside a film set and so on and so forth. The type of cinema has also changed and therefore the entire approach to cinema must change with the times. We can't go back to a 1950 standard and you certainly can't have five people sitting in a darkened auditorium deciding what's good for a billion people and saying that 
we, the grandfathers, know best what's good for the rest of uh, India, a billion people, and all of them have mutton for brains. I mean, <laughs> that's true. That's a hard one to argue <laughs> against. Yeah, but but let's move on to a question that I've been interested about, which is not something you directly touched on, but on institutional autonomy vis-a-vis -vis rights of individuals. Now, I have a question for you, which is more in the nature of a quiz question. I'm going to read out a provision of a constitution uh, from the 20th century, and you have to identify which country's constitution this is. Uh, I'm quoting, every citizen has the right to submit proposals to state bodies and public organizations for improving their activity and to criticize shortcomings in their work. Persecution for criticism is prohibited. Persons guilty of such persecution shall be called to account. I'm not familiar with this, but it sounds to me like something that might have come from South Africa. Well, no, I think you're giving it a far more exalted uh, lineage than it is. These sterling words were part of the 1977 Soviet constitution. Oh, really? And Did the, not know which is why it's interesting because they were also given... And you're not the first one to be mistaken. I made the same mistake because these are high sounding words. Correct. And it also goes on to say citizens are guaranteed freedom of speech, of the press, of assembly, meetings, street processions and demonstrations. Exercise of these political freedoms is ensured by putting public buildings, streets and squares at the disposal of the people. Now, these are high sounding words. And But this is what the framers of the American Constitution called parchment guarantees, Correct. right? And, and I was looking at what Justice Scalia said as in about that, about this. He said about autonomy and rights, he said, because the real constitution of the Soviet Union, the pro, that is the provisions that establish the institution of government, do not prevent the centralization of power in one man or one party. This is what enables these guarantees to be ignored. Structure is everything. Unquote. How do you see in India where the focus of much of constitutional law has really been on rights and not so much on autonomy of institutions and structures of power. How do you see this having? Well, this is very interesting. And let's get back to this unfamiliar Soviet example and see what happened because it directly led to, well, what the economist once called the UFFR, which is the union of fewer and fewer republics <laughs> and ultimately to the state that we see today. But uh, Scalia's words are ac accurate, of course. And in India, they have a special resonance because our structures are founded on not allowing a single person to completely dominate, well, in the broader sense, government. This has been attempted most famously in the emergency, and it has always been a failure. What uh, One of the methods that illiberal governments use to consolidate power is to use the structures of democracy and liberal governance, especially the right to free speech. Mm. To consolidate power, you need a strong man who exercises that right of free speech to gather to him or unto him a large body of people to silence everybody else and thereby moves towards illiberalism using the structures that we've spoken about. That is something that we have to guard against. And one of the things uh, that we have with us to guard against that is to have institutions at different levels that have autonomy and provide space to question, to doubt, and to shake this tree and to keep it constantly shaking. That's right. And But if I were to push you a little bit further, when we see landmark cases relating to film censorship or yes. bans on movies. As in the only arguments we see in court are simple 191A versus 192 oh, kind of arguments, which is, I can understand where it's coming from, given the fact that there is a fundamental right in the Constitution. But don't you think perhaps it's time to think about, in an argument in court, 
about how the film certification body is appointed absolutely how the film certification body goes about its absolutely. operational tasks in fact i must say that uh, with justice manmohan sareen heading the appellate body uh, he has quite quietly but firmly put into place the requirement uh, of giving reasons something that directly addresses this question of subjectivity we in court tend to see only the end result of it without the reasons uh there's a dual problem here the act itself has generalized statements and then there are generalized guidelines yeah. the decisions very often that come to us have no linkage and no nexus to either what is stated in the statute or even what is in the guidelines we are just told we think this is unsuitable for children because a child will be frightened mm. now what frightens a child depends on the child depends on the parents depends on context it's not possible to say this as a generalized statement and we can't have a body that allows uh, itself this level of subjectivity we must have a body that takes a step back and says this is a reason this is a reason that can be tested objectively barring that we are allowing artistic freedom we do need to look at in fact a complete revamp of the uh, uh, cinematograph act uh, one of the reasons is that look we fall into the habit of calling it a censor board it's that's not right. that's right it's not censorship is a very different thing that's right it's a very different thing as in it is supposed to be film certification it's film certification yeah. it's we've just called it a censor board which tells us where we have put ourselves in relation to that certifying authority that's right so actually just taking it a bit wider as in and going back to my question on uh how constitutional litigation in india happens uh of course fundamental rights have great evocative value and the supreme court and high courts have given it wide interpretation so pretty much anything can come within the holy trinity of article 14 19 and 21 what surprises me though is the fact that similar if not equally significant litigation hasn't happened around see the scope of executive power when we are still talking about executive power we go back to ram javaya kapoor 1955 and we say that executive power is coterminous with legislative power and if the legislature has not chosen to act then the executive can act do you think that there is further room constitutionally to think about separation of powers both horizontally between the legislature and the executive i'm keeping the judiciary out for the moment and also perhaps vertically given the changes in oh absolutely absolutely and place. i'll tell you one of the biggest biggest shortcomings jurisprudentially is this entire doctrine we have evolved about uh, judicial review and the limits of judicial review essentially to say that we do not look at the decision itself but only at the decision making process now bureaucrats have begun to weaponize this they are very good at having an ex- impeccable decision making process to render an unspeakable decision this happens most spectacularly in town planning i see and it's quite interesting because you have uh, an executive decision that is disastrous for the city or the planning unit contrary to a fundamental mandate of the planning statute which is broadly stated but the decision making process is impeccably done and therefore impervious to judicial review and attack in court i we need to look at this and we need to ask bureaucrats not just how they have come to the decision but more particularly why they have come to it and how they believe it subserves the statutory intent very often bureaucrats say this regulation or this statute permits that and permits this discretion therefore i have done this there's actually been a dramatic change in the executive bureaucratic uh, landscape from the 50s and the 60s to today a part of that is our whole approach to corruption where we believe that no bureaucrat can ever take an independent innovative de- decision unless he's been bought over mm. or there's some 
uh, backhanding going on or something of that kind. And the idea that a bureaucrat, a good bureaucrat, will actually act in furtherance of the public interest is just become alien to us. Uh, the concept that a government or a bureau, bureaucrat could draw on the private sector mm -hmm. for its domain expertise instantly questioned in a PIL. That's right. That's become part of our governance mess. That's right. So it's and and I'd end, end with this final question that theoretically autonomy is a good thing. In India, sometimes autonomy is seen as a license to be corrupt. Now, given that, how do you see in an ideal structuring of these bodies autonomy? and accountability working together? Tough one. Uh, there is a need for a structural functional autonomy. Uh, you can't keep out allegations of corruption. You'll have to deal with them. The processes of the institution, I think, need to be more transparent. And I'm sure that that can be easily done with more instruments for transparency, including online accessibility, right to information, and all the rest of it. That shouldn't be a problem. But this is not my immediate concern. I'm actually concerned about the fact that we're not talking about the theoretical underpinnings of autonomy and the need for autonomy in institutions and why they are, this is essential to a system of governance like ours. We only talk about individual pockets uh, so this particular university or that particular body needs to be autonomous. We're not asking ourselves why. And I think that debate is central and should be brought back to the forefront. That's right. And I think that's a good note to end with that we really need to start taking our autonomy seriously because that's what's really necessary for the health of our republic. Absolutely. For the future of our republic. For the future of our republic. Yes. Thanks very much, Justice Thank you. Patel, Thank you for so joining much. us. Thanks Thank you very so much. much. Time for our quiz clatter, our legal quiz that's a bit tougher than clat. Our answer from last week about what connects Al Gore, George W. Bush, scalding coffee at McDonald's and an exploding gas tank is Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader was the third presidential candidate in the famous Bush v. Gore presidential contest. And he's also set up a museum of tort law in his hometown of Winstead, Connecticut, where two of the displays are the scalding coffee at McDonald's and an exploding gas tank, which are famous tort law cases. Our winner from last week, the frankly tough question, is Nirmal Bhansali. Congratulations, Nirmal, and a gift voucher awaits. Time for this week's quiz. In a week where we've seen that some people are more equal than others, I thought it would be interesting to ask this question. Note the words carefully. Who wrote and who said the following words? All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. That's a relatively easy one for you to crack. Do write in with your responses to justify at vidhilegalpolicy.in and stand a chance to win an Amazon gift voucher. Thanks very much for tuning in to this special episode with Justice Patel. I hope you enjoyed it. Till next week, adjourn. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, follow us on Twitter at Vidhi underscore India for regular updates. Follow us on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, or any other podcast channel that you know to tune in to our next episode. Email us at justify at vidhilegalpolicy.in to share your comments and feedback on this episode. We look forward to hearing from you.